Do we have to go through the, hi the history? Do we can do uh, virtually anything you want to do. Let's talk about something else. What would, you, what would you like to talk about? Oh, I see. <laughs> well, let's, uh, maybe we should go through the history. No, I... <laughs> Simon and Garfunkel have achieved legendary status, selling over a hundred million records and securing their place among the most successful music artists of all time. While their iconic tracks like The Sound of Silence and Bridge Over Troubled Water became timeless classics, it was really their volatile relationship and frequent public disputes that left a lasting mark on music history. And let me ask you a question to kick off. Whose side are you on? Simon's or Garfunkel's? Oh, this is a juicy one today. Welcome back to Music Mongoose. It all began in 1953 in New York when two 11-year-old boys, Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel, first crossed paths at Parsons High School in Queens. The two quickly formed a close friendship, bonding over countless hours of music and even sharing their first cigarette together. After performing together in a school production of Alice in Wonderland, they decided to take their shared passion further by trying their hand at singing as a duo. Let's see, Paul was the neighbor three blocks away whom I met in the sixth grade, so we were 11. And I think we were singing right in the beginning, because shortly after that came Alan Freed's rock and roll radio show, and we, we were all ears for that, and somewhat competitive. So it must have been like 1954 that we were starting to harmonize together. Paul and Art, inspired by their love for the Everly Brothers, began experimenting with writing their own music in a similar style. On October 16th, 1957, just three days after Simon's 16th birthday, they recorded their debut single, Hey Schoolgirl, at a Manhattan recording studio. The independent label Big Records signed the duo, and the record label's big boss, Sid Prozen, released the track under the name Tom and Jerry. Hey Schoolgirl was a hit, selling 10,000 copies and climbing to number 49 on the Billboard charts. However, the taste of early fame sparked the first of many conflicts between the two. Sid Prozen approached Paul with an offer to record two singles as a solo artist. In his excitement, Simon agreed, making a critical mistake. He failed to inform his partner, Art. Feeling deeply betrayed by Simon's decision to move forward without him, Garfunkel was left with a growing sense of resentment and distrust. This incident laid the groundwork for the underlying tension that would persist between them. Now, Garfunkel was acutely aware of the power balance between them. Because Simon was the songwriter, Garfunkel was just a singer. A certain amount of competitiveness that's, you know, dealt into the equation by comparisons. And that's unhealthy. It's not good for friendship. When the two new Tom and Jerry singles failed to take off, Paul and Art parted ways by 1958, only to cross paths again in 1963. The duo decided to give their partnership another go. Now, both had been developing their own music individually, but Garfunkel was particularly struck by one of Simon's early compositions, a song called the Sound of Silence. They signed with Columbia Records, and despite concerns that their new name might sound more like a law firm, rebranded themselves as Simon and Garfunkel. In 1964, they released the album Wednesday Morning 3am. Now, the album itself didn't really gain much attention from critics or the public, but The Sound of Silence started generating traction on its own. It became particularly popular among university students, and two years after its release in 1966, reached the top of the Billboard charts. The pair's next two albums, Sound of Silence and Parsley Sage, Rosemary and Time, were major successes. When they recorded the soundtrack for The Graduates in 1967, their song Mrs. Robinson dominated the charts, holding the number one spot for nine consecutive weeks. So in just a few short years, Simon and Garfunkel had become millionaires from their music but tensions between them were starting to rise. Paul, who had been in and out of therapy, struggled with his mental health for many years. Reflecting on this in 1984, he said, most people look at me and wonder how could that guy be depressed? 
and I now feel that people were seeing a more accurate picture of me than I was. I eventually realized, Jesus, all I've been looking at is this thin slice of pie that has got the bad news in it, and I'm disregarding the rest of the picture. When asked about the bad news he was focusing on, Simon explained being short, not having a voice that you want, not looking the way that you want to look, having a bad relationship. Some of that is real, and if you start to roll it together, that's what you focus on. Simon and Garfunkel's manager, Mort Lewis, grew increasingly concerned about the rivalry brewing between the two. They both envied the other's piece in the team, he observed. Paul often thought the audience saw Artie as the star because he was the featured singer, and some people probably thought Artie even wrote the songs. But Artie knew Paul was the songwriter and therefore held the duo's future in his hands. I don't think he ever got over what happened with Tom and Jerry. Then came the recording of Bridge Over Troubled Water. After working on the soundtrack for The Graduate, Art Garfunkel took on an acting role in the film Catch-22, while Paul Simon focused on writing songs. This turned out to be a move that would frustrate Simon, although Garfunkel couldn't see why it was a big deal. Um, I went off and did Catch-22 because the way we recorded in all of those Simon and Garfunkel records was for Paul to write the tunes over a period of weeks and months. When three or four were ready, we went into the studio with Roy Halley and the musicians and recorded them over the next month. Then we stopped, and Paul wrote the next batch of three or four. During that three or four month period of time, we were possibly touring, in which case I was living with the writing of the songs in the hotel rooms, and Paul would be in the holiday and noodling on advancing the tune, and I would be thinking of the record we're gonna make of it. Uh, if it weren't that, then I'd be elsewhere. So there were always these stops. When I went to do Catch-22, it was my intention to be in Mexico for a couple of months while Paul was working on the next batch of Bridge Over Troubled Water songs. Uh, the problem was, Paul was ready with the next batch before Mike Nichols was ready to release me from Guaymas, Mexico. So that's what made Paul for the first time feel, I have to wait for Artie? Which, of course, is an unheard of thing. Simon believed that if Artie had become a big movie star, he would never return to the duo. Instead of just being the guy who sang Paul Simon songs, he could be Art Garfunkel, a big star all by himself. And this made me think about how I could still be the guy who wrote songs and sing them. I don't need Artie, he said. In July 1970, just months after the release of their final album, Bridge Over Troubled Water, the duo played a concert in New York. Unbeknownst to the audience, it would be their last performance together before their split. After the show, they shook hands in the parking lot and went their separate ways, not even acknowledging the fact that it was the final show. After a decade apart, the duo did reunite for a one-off concert in New York in 1981. Although plans for a follow-up album emerged, they never came to fruition. We had grown apart, Simon admitted. We didn't think the same musically. We'd had 11 years of making our own records, where you didn't have to agree on it. You just did what you wanted. Simon described the creative process as torturous. Artie would write a harmony that he really liked, and I would say, I don't like that harmony. And he'd say, well, that's the harmony. And I'd say, no, you can't just write the wrong harmony to my song. Another decade then passed before they would reunite again in 1993 for a series of shows this time. However, a review from a critic only deepened the rift between them. He said this, Mr. Garfunkel turned out to be just one of a large supporting cast of Mr. Simon's collaborators and fellow singers, which created a tense and icy atmosphere backstage. Joseph Raskoff, Simon's business manager, recalled the aftermath saying, I genuinely believed that if there had been a knife on the table, one of them would have used it. Following those shows, the pair took another, you guessed it, 10 year break before reuniting again in 2003 and 2004 for their Old Friends Tour. The tour, which featured a series of performances at New York's Madison Square Garden to promote their new album, Old Friends, was marked by a noticeable warmth between the two on stage. Fans observed that they seemed to genuinely enjoy each other's company, but this newfound harmony was short-lived. In 2010, Art and Garfunkel planned a series of concerts across the US and Canada. Despite experiencing vocal issues, Art assured Paul that his voice would be fine for the shows. However, after their performance at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival on April 24th, it became evident that Art's earlier illness 
had significantly affected his vocal cords, leading to the entire tour being cancelled. Now, Paul was outraged by this. He thought Art was being dishonest about his illness, and any last dream of reigniting that partnership had been obliterated. Art, in a 2018 interview with The Telegraph, expressed his frustration, calling Paul an idiot for ending the band. Nevertheless, Simon remained resolute. He let us all down. I was tired of all the drama, Simon told biographer Robert Hilburn. I didn't feel I could trust him anymore. Paul Simon announced his retirement from touring the same year. This marked the final chapter for the once inseparable duo, who had been friends since their school days and would never perform together again. In a 2023 documentary, Paul Simon looks back on his friendship with Art. That was a good friendship. That was a real first friendship of somebody that got it. For me, to turn into a person that I hope I never see again, that's a long way. I always find it deeply sad when personal issues get in the way of potentially great music. Of course, this is what happened between Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks with Fleetwood Mac. I've made another video about them and their feud. You can click over here to watch that one next.